have been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned and scarred. Marred and twisted, scarred by the past I need to be lifted. And sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light, unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind, and something created me. No, someone created me, and that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling, that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. Welcome. How's everybody doing? Great to see you guys today. I want to say a quick hello to all of our campuses. Thanks for being a part of our services today. Let's also give it up for our God Behind Bars guys real quick. We love you guys. Grateful to have you here. I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. How many of you guys ate too much? I ate way too much myself. I wore my maternity pants. It was great. So glad you guys are here. Hope you had a great weekend with family and the in-laws and the outlaws were there, I'm sure. And so we had a great time as well. I'm so excited this weekend to introduce one of my dearest friends. He's a pastor in uh, Cincinnati, and uh, he's actually technically in Kentucky, but it's a suburb of Cincinnati. And uh, this guy is an amazing leader. He's on our board of directors. So if you ever wonder, like, who does Pastor Bill answer to? This is one of the guys that I answer to gladly. I'm accountable to him. Uh, he's a dear friend. Whenever I'm having a, a problem trying to figure out a leadership crisis situation, I text this guy. And so he, he prays for us. He loves our church. In fact, when we had the Hurricane Harvey hit here, he was one of the first guys that reached out. What can I do, Pastor? And I told him what he could do, and he did it. He basically, they sent resources. Then he actually called all his friends of other churches around the country, because he's a pretty influential guy, and had all of them that didn't even know us send resources to us as well. That's the kind of guy that he is. Is that really cool or what? <laughs> Amazing guy. He took over. He took over a church in Cincinnati that was, that was falling apart in total dysfunction, had already split multiple times. He came into a church of about 200 people, 10 years ago in disarray and turned it into a healthy church of 7,000 people right now. I mean, this guy is an amazing leader. You're about, to, you're about to hear some incredible depth of his messages. Just the teaching is phenomenal. He's got a bunch of Cincinnati Bengals going to his church because he's that kind of a leader. Please give it up for my dear friend. Let's give a warm South Texas welcome to Pastor Marcus Meekum. go. There we go. I found you. Can we give it up for your pastor? Um, great friend of mine. Incredible human being, incredible man of God. And we're ch as a church thankful for his leadership as well. Our staff loves when Bill Cornelius comes. Our church loves him. A lot of the statements that we have framed that we consistently use at our church came from your pastor. He's a brilliant leader and thinker. And uh, his wife, Jessica, his family mean the world to us. He's a true friend to me. And so to be here with you, uh, to hear about you constantly, um, to look at his life's work, uh, the people that I believe Paul said it's almost like childbirth sometimes when you're trying to see people come into the maturity uh, in Christ. And so glad to be here, honored to be here, thankful uh, to be with you today. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. While you're turning there real quick, I just want to give you a feel uh, for who I am because this is my first time with you. I think I was here on a midweek service, but my first time here with you on a weekend. And so I just want you to 
get a feel for who I am a little bit. Um, I'm married, 21 years, coming up on 21 years. Amazing. And um, somebody said, well, how do you stay married for 21 years? Don't get a divorce. And that's, that's, that's that. And um, have two daughters, 19 and 16. And so uh, my 16-year-old just officially got her license. So if you're in Cincinnati, uh, stay off the roads. And um, she's uh, just amazing kids. They love the Lord. They love church, which is a big deal when you love the church um, like Sarah and I do, to watch your kids fall in love with it as well. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up around this kind of stuff. Um, I was actually born in a, a home where my mother was a drug addict, and um, my dad was an atheist, maybe not professed, but in general um, was not a believer. And I remember when I got invited to a church, I was 16 years old, and somebody said, hey, you want to go to church with us? I'm like, man, I'm not going to church. And he said, there's free ice cream and hot girls. <laughs> well, I like ice cream and I like girls, so let's go. And so I went to church. I'll never forget the pastor preaching, and I'd never heard preaching like this. I mean, he's like red in the face, veins popping out of his neck, spits flying everywhere. And he's talking about Jesus dying on the cross, and he's so graphic and about how bloody and horrific the scene of the cross was and how Jesus was beaten, how it was my sin that crucified him. And I'll never forget as I heard that, my heart being pierced and touched. I'll never forget at the end of the sermon, he looked at those kids that were there and he said, hey, if you want to go to heaven and not hell, raise your hand. And so I raised my hand. I thought, that sounds good to me. <laughs> and my friend that was there with me said, put your hand down. You're embarrassing us. You're messing up our game with the girls. I said, you can go to hell if you want to. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Didn't have much Bible, didn't know anything about the Bible, didn't know anything. Never heard John 3.16, never heard of David and Goliath, never heard of any of those things. But they gave me, I answered the altar call and went down to an altar. And I remember the, the two individuals praying with me. I remember a tear streaming down my face. I remember um, feeling like a thousand pounds had lifted off my shoulders. They handed me a, a, what now I know is a New Testament Bible. And they said, you're a Christian now, you have to read this. It wasn't an option to them. They said, you're a Christian, you have to read this. I'd never read a book in my whole life. I didn't even go to school my eighth grade year. I was a minority in my school. I was getting jumped all the time, so I quit going to school my eighth grade years. So I'd never read a book in my whole life. And the second I went home that night, I started to read the Bible. And interestingly enough, I had an insatiable desire to understand what the Scripture meant and said. I had not been able to go to church because I worked all the time, and I remember running into the youth pastor just out and about in town one day, and he's like, man, where have you been? I'm like, man, I work all the time. I'm not able to go to church on Sundays. I said, but I've been reading that book that you gave me. I didn't even know it was a Bible. I said, I've been reading that book that you gave me, and I read about the guy Matthew, and I read about the guy Mark. I read about the guy Luke, and then I'm reading about the guy John. I'm like, but it's like deja vu when I read it. I feel like I'm reading the same thing over and over and over again. It's like the spookiest thing ever. And he explained to me that, you know, the, each of the gospel writers were the, one author, each author writing about the same account from a different account from a different perspective. And I began to fall in love with the scripture. I also immediately had this desire to preach and to do what I'm doing right now. As crazy as it sounds, I immediately wanted to see lives impacted the way mine was just through the simple preaching of the gospel. Of course, no one wanted to hear what I had to say. So I would sit in my pickup truck for years and I would write sermons and I would preach to myself in my pickup truck. And man, I'd preach so hard. And I mean, I'd preach like, like spits flying there all over my steering wheel. There's spit all over the windshield. I mean, I would just preach with everything that I had. I remember I wanted to see someone get saved, so, but nobody was there. So I would jump in the passenger seat and I would answer my own altar call. I'd lift my hand and say, <laughs> I'd lead myself in a sinner's prayer. So my point is simply this. Every time I preach, I visit those moments in that pickup truck where I felt 
the anointing, the touch of God in such a special way that that's always my prayer. God, if you can show up in this service with these people the way you did in that pickup truck years and years ago, we'll all know that we've heard from God. Amen? Amen. So Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. And I'm going to run through several verses here just for the sake of time. If you look at verse 1, let's say through verse 8, there's the story of Zacchaeus. Most of us have heard that story. It's a familiar story. And we know that Jesus goes to have a meal with Zacchaeus. As a result of this meal, something happens in Zacchaeus' heart that he commits to give back anything that he's stolen and actually increases it, I believe, fourfold back to people that he's taken something from. And then he's so, Jesus is so criticized for his time with Zacchaeus that he responds and says Zacchaeus and his entire house are in heaven, they're in glory today as a result of that meal. Then Jesus says something in verse 10, and I want you to watch this connection. He says, for the Son of Man has come to save and seek that which was lost. This is his response to the criticism that he had concerning having a meal with Zacchaeus. Now, the story is not over, but most of the time we stop. Because if you'll read in verse number 11, it says right up front, now as they heard these things, so it's the same environment, it's the same setting. The people that have just criticized Jesus for having a meal with Zacchaeus, Jesus is still talking. The conversation has not ended. He says, now as he's heard these things, he spoke another parable. So Jesus is about to explain to them what's going on, not just with him and Zacchaeus, but what's happening in their hearts. In verse 12, he tells the parable. And he says, a certain nobleman, a king, a master, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants and he delivered to each one of them 10 minus, or to each one a minus. So 10 servants and each one reserved one mina. Your translation might say coin or treasure. And he said to them, do business or occupy until I come. Carry on, keep going, keep pressing, keep fighting. Don't stop no matter how far gone. Drop down to verse 16. And the master came back and he goes to the first servant wanting to know how he did with the mina that he was given. He said, well, master, your servant has earned 10 minas with the one. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant, because you are faithful with very little. I give you authority over 10 cities. And then the next guy, he said, I turned it into five and he gave him authority over five cities. And then he goes to the third. And many of you know the story. He did nothing with the treasure that he was given. He actually wraps it in a handkerchief. And many translations actually say he buried, he actually buried that mina or he buried that treasure. Now, what we're about to see here is, again, this is all happening in the same setting, one setting. These are not two different events. This is the same event. Zacchaeus, Jesus has just seen him tra transformed, his life changed. That's, that has just happened. Jesus is being criticized for it. And during the criticism, he tells this exact story. So this is a parable concerning the value of a soul. I believe God wants to show every one of us here today through his word the immeasurable, infinite value Jesus places on one soul. Out of the gate, what I need you to do for me is I need you to forget everything you've ever heard about this parable. I need you to give me fresh eyes for a familiar story. I promise you, I listen to 20 sermons a week. I've done it for 26 years. Some of the greatest preachers in the world are my friends, and I've never heard this story from the perspective you're about to hear it from. I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm saying that it is incomplete without hearing what we're going to talk about over the next 20 minutes. Are you ready? You've heard this story primarily from... A story has characters, so the primary, char primary characters in the story is the master, the king, we hear a lot about him, or the ten servants. But I'm going to introduce the third character, the mina, or the treasure. So I want us to move the king and the servants to the background. We've heard sermons about them. And I want us to spotlight the overlooked, silent third character, the mina, or the treasure. 
Now, when you hear about mina or treasure, immediately we think money. But understand in the mind of, mind of God, when he says treasure, he's not talking about money. He's not talking about finances. He's talking about Zacchaeus. He's explaining to us the great value he places on one soul. So let's look at the treasure. Let's pull it front and center. And let's look at this story from its perspective. First thing that we know is the treasure begins in the king's hands. Now, each, all the treasure here is distributed evenly to each one of the servants. Each servant, each one of the ten servants receives one mina or one treasure. Ten servants, ten mina, each one receive one. This is not socialism. This is talking about the value of a soul. Now let's watch it, and we're going to go through a few things real quick together. The first thing that we need to see is the treasure had no choice which hands it was placed in. The treasure had no choice which hands it was placed in. It had a one in ten chance of being placed in faithful hands, and the same odds existed that one of the treasures would end up in unfaithful hands. The treasure here had no choice concerning whose hands it ended up with. So what we know about the treasure is its future value had everything to do with whose hands it ended up in. One mina ends up ten times greater than it initially was. The other mina ends up or treasure ends up with zero value. And Jesus says it's not because of choice, but rather its future value was influenced by whose hands it was placed in. One mina is placed in faithful hands, caring hands, nurturing hands, loving hands, hands that see its value, hands that see its worth, hands that see its future potential. The other treasure is placed in unfaithful hands, uncaring hands, hands that are neglectful, resentful, indifferent, abusive. They see no value, they see no worth, and they see no future potential. You see, we don't know Zacchaeus' backstory is what Jesus is saying. We don't know what he's gone through. We don't know the hands that he has been placed in that have led him to this place that we deem him completely invaluable. And many of us can relate to this story because we can look at our life and we can admit that for many of us, we didn't really have a say concerning whose hands we ended up in. Many of you have been in unfaithful hands in life. You and I don't choose who our parents are. We don't choose that the dad walks out. You don't choose that, that the uncle is abusive. You don't, you don't choose the kind of environment that you're raised in. You and I don't choose that a teacher uh, overlooks you or demeans you or a coach overlooks you or a spouse is, is emotionally or verbally or physically abusive. You and I many times don't choose the pastors, the churches, the friends that, that betray you or hurt you or use you in some way. It's unfortunate, but many people end up in unfaithful hands. And because of the hands they end up in, they believe that they're of zero value. They're of little value, not by choice, but because of the hands they were placed in. Could you imagine the treasure, how it must have felt, beginning like all the other treasures, watching them as they succeeded, watching them as they moved forward and looking at its life, thinking to itself, I, I maybe am not like them and I maybe don't have what they have, but surely there's something in me. Surely there's some value that's there. Surely there's something to offer. But, but this treasure experiences none of that. It's totally devalued. It's completely and totally diminished to zero because of whose hands it ended up in. It's important that we know, number one, that the treasure had no choice whose hands it ended up in. And we know that this is true, maybe not in our own life, but it is true. If you're in Uganda in a village and you're a young girl and the militia comes in and kills your family and then they kidnap you and sell you into sex trafficking, you don't end up there by choice. The same value that you and I have, 
The same worth, the same potential exists in her, but she's placed in unfaithful hands and it impacts her potential future value because of the environments she's experienced. Number two, we read here that the same unfaithful hands that saw no value, saw no worth, saw no potential, now are wrapping this treasure, this mina, in a handkerchief, translation burial clause, because the same unfaithful hands now grab a shovel and they're digging a grave. The same hands that saw no value, no worth, no future potential now are digging a grave and they're taking the treasure and they're putting it six foot under the ground. Remember, Zacchaeus is the treasure. A human being is the treasure. The human being that we're talking about still is breathing. He still has life. And so the translation here is in the parable, he's being buried alive. Can you imagine how terrifying that must have been? Can you imagine how terrifying it would be to be buried alive? And this treasure now has to live underneath the dirt that someone else has shoveled onto him. Have you ever been that way in life? Buried? Man, I have. Sometimes I feel so buried in life. Buried underneath the dirt. Not that I put on myself. I, I, I've, I've done myself. I put some dirt on myself. But in life, sometimes somebody else was shoveling all that stuff. The pressure, the worry, the anxiety. Man, it buries you over time. Many people live their whole life buried under the rejection, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the resentment. Buried by guilt and shame. And regret buried by the divorce, buried by the failure, buried by the pain, buried by the loss. And the problem with being buried is we all know in this world a grave is permanent. When you're in the grave, it's finality. There's, there's no change. There's no hope of a future. There's, there's no life. Everywhere you look, you're being pressed down upon, pressed in upon, and suffocated by despair and darkness. And Jesus says, I want you to listen to me because we live in a world of Zacchaeuses. We live in a world where people have been so devalued by the church. They believe that they're zero, they're nothing, they're zilch. A generation has been buried alive and Jesus is saying here, that's why I came. I came to seek and to save. I came to look out for, to go after those everyone else has given up on. It's important that we understand Jesus says in the middle of this story, our instructions when we hear this parable are to occupy until he comes. Again, occupy means carry on, keep going, don't stop. No matter how far gone someone is, don't give up. Keep digging, keep working. Don't give up on anybody. Why and how do we occupy? How do we keep going no matter what? Brings us to point number three. Is the grave is serious, but it's temporary. To the world, a grave is permanent, But with God, it's temporary. As a matter of fact, Jesus is famous for interrupting funerals. Ask Jairus' daughter. Everybody says, Jesus, stay back. It's a waste of your time to come here. Jesus barges in, kicks everybody out, and he says, listen, the grave, it's serious, it's real, it's sad, it's heartbreaking, but because he's in the scenario, it's temporary. It's not final. It's not forever. There is hope. There is a future because he's in the picture. The Bible says Lazarus has been gone for four days. Jesus shows up. He's weeping because of the seriousness of what's happening. They're saying he's stinking. He's been dead for so long. There's no hope. There's no chance. But Jesus shows up and he interrupts the death scenario. He reminds us that the grave is not final. It's serious where people end up. It's horrific what's happened to many people. How they've 
ended up in life, the things that they've gone through, the addictions that have buried them, the pain that's buried them, the things that have gotten, found their way to, to on top of their, and their whole life is feeling suffocated. It's serious. But Jesus reminds us it's temporary. As a matter of fact, he wants to remind us so much that it's temporary. When he has to find his own grave, he borrows it, right? The borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he doesn't buy it. Which gives us the instructions, whatever grave you found yourself in, however buried you feel, it's temporary. Don't buy the grave, borrow it. Don't, don't buy into the idea that you're never gonna love again because of something that's happened to you, just borrow it. Borrow the depression, don't buy it. Borrow the failure, don't, don't buy the idea that you are a failure. Borrow the mistake, but don't believe that you are a mistake. Borrow the heartbreak, but don't buy it. The grave is serious, but it is temporary. The Bible is clear that it's all about a third day. Not just a third day for Jesus, but the Bible says if he was raised up, we can be raised up, which means, hey, you will love again. You will dream again. You will have hope again. You will have joy again. You will laugh again. Because that's why Jesus came. He came to restore all things, renew all things, and reconcile all things. Why? What's his instructions? Occupy. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't quit fighting. No matter what, no matter how far gone someone or something is, never, never quit digging and believing for them. Why? Number four, the best part, and I'm done. The king says in verse 24, think about this. The king says to the buried treasure, the guy who buried the treasure, he says to his servants, he says, I want you to go find that treasure. I want you to go find it. I want you to go get it. I want you to go dig it up. Because what we learn finally in this story is God never leaves behind buried treasure. You may feel buried today, but you're still valuable. You may feel like you're under the weight of the world, but you're still of great value to him. Don't forget that Jesus was also placed in some unfaithful hands. Don't forget that he was also placed in some ruthless hands, some violent hands, some, some spiteful hands, some, some hateful hands. They beat him with those hands. They tortured him with those hands. They crucified him with those hands. But on the third day, the king reached into that grave and pulled out heaven's treasure. All through the scripture, we begin to find this is how God interacts with us. You might be a lost sheep a lost coin, a lost son, but God never leaves behind buried treasure. The Bible actually says it like this. The Bible actually says it like this, that the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a man who finds a treasure in a field and he goes and he sells everything that he has. That's Jesus. Gives up everything that he has for one reason, to buy the field that the treasure is in. Jesus gave everything up to buy back whatever has buried you today. The world says, Zacchaeus, you're a lost cause. But Jesus says, nah, you're of great worth to me. You're treasure to me. I wish we could see Jesus right now in this parable. I wish we could see him finding his way into the field where this treasure was buried. I wish you could see him with his nail scarred bloody hands digging through the dirt. I wish you could see him as he's resuming Zacchaeus from his grave. I wish you could see what he's trying to say here that God never, no matter how far gone someone is, leaves behind buried treasure. What we're talking about here is the immeasurable value of one soul. The Bible says the king finds the treasure, unwraps the treasure, and says, give this one that was an unfaithful hands, neglectful hands, hands that saw no future, hands that saw no value, 
Hands that took that treasure and dug a grave, placed it six feet under the ground. Take that treasure and I want you to give it to the one who's been faithful with everything he's been ha- that he's been given. Give it to the one that has 10 cities. In other words, what we begin to see here in verse 26 is if you want to know who God blesses the most, and if you want to know why God blesses them, God blesses soul winners. God deeply stands behind anyone that sees the value of one soul. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, there is infinite, immeasurable value in one soul. Before we pray, I want to encourage you as a church. I want to encourage you to keep winning souls. I want to encourage you to keep seeing value in the Zacchaeuses of this world. I want to encourage you to never be talked out of the importance of creating spaces and environments where those who have found themselves in unfaithful hands, found themselves buried in life, can come to a place, experience the grace, the love, the forgiveness of God, and have a chance to experience that no matter what they've been through, they are still of great worth to God. I want to encourage you. As you prepare for the offering in a couple weeks that you're going to receive, it's not why I, was, I came in, but I want to encourage you to be found faithful in valuing souls. One servant saw the treasure and said, ah, it's not worth much. The other servant saw the incredible value and God gave him cities. What am I trying to say? If you'll continue to be faithful with the little, the people everyone else overlooks and marginalizes, God promises that there will be incredible blessing that continues to back your life, your family, your home, and this church. Because God never leaves behind buried treasure. Can I pray for you? Every eye closed, every head bowed. You know, I know many of you are here today and you say, man, I feel buried. Buried under sin, buried under regret, buried under mistakes. You've been running from God. You've turned your back on God. You've been living your own life. In your mind, you're of zero value because of what you've done, where you've been. But today, as we've opened up the word of God You've been there and you've been saying, yeah, you know, I, I felt buried, but I can sense that maybe God is trying to pull me out of that grave, pull me out of the darkness, pull me out of the place that I've been living. And if you're here today and you say, I need forgiveness, I need, I need to be cleansed, I need to be washed, I need to turn from that life. You're here today and you'd say, I need to put my trust in Christ You would say, I need to put my trust in Jesus. I need to be forgiven. I need a new beginning. I need a new start. And you would like me to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to humiliate you. But all across this room, from the front to the back, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And if you're here today and you'd say, Marcus, I need to place my trust in Christ. I need to get right with God. I can't keep going the direction that I've been going. You need a turnaround. You need a new start. And you would like me to pray for you. When I hit three, just lift your hand as high as you can. And we're going to pray together. You say, why lift my hand? I believe it's you saying yes to God. I believe it's you taking a moment and saying, I'm not going back to the life that I was living. I believe it's a moment where you're taking a stand and saying, no more am I going to live the life that I've been living. But I'm going to fully surrender everything that I am to the one who died to pull me out of the grave. If that's you, on the count of three, all across this room, quickly lift your hand. You say, I need forgiveness. I want to place my trust in Christ. I need a new beginning. I need a new start. One, two, three. Lift your hand as high as you can. Many hands are going up. I'm just going to ask you to place your hand over your heart. And all across this room, Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is God's only son and that he raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. A miracle is about to happen in your life. A miracle that begins. This is not the ending point, but it is a starting point. 
It's a miracle. Only God can perform. A preacher can't perform it. Only God can change a human heart. And that miracle is about to happen in your heart. When you lifted your hand, that was a moment of faith. That was you saying, yes, God, I want to put my trust in you. And now we're going to seal that deal by simply praying this prayer. Let's say this together, everyone, all across this room, especially those who raise your hand. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross, for shedding your blood for my sin. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, wash me. I believe that you're God's son, that he raised you from the dead. And now I put my full trust in you. In Jesus' name, we all said a big amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the word of God a good hand clap together.